Well, welcome everybody. Um, good evening, good after, good morning to wherever you are. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the second uh, talk of this uh, seminar series arranged by, you know, is the is a is a partnership between Sabancı University and Harvard Medical School, Mass General Hospital. Uh, our our guest today is Dr. John, Bish John Bischoff. Uh, and he'll be talking about his uh, work in nanowarming for regenerative medicine. So briefly, uh, John, Dr. Dr. Bischoff, he obtained his uh, bachelor's degree from bioengineering in, from UC Berkeley. Uh, and then he did uh, his training uh, for masters in UC San Francisco, then P he obtained a PhD degree in biomechanical engineering, again from UC Berkeley in 1992. So he did a, a postdoctoral fellowship at Harvard Medical School in the Center for Engineering and Medicine, and later he joined the faculty at University of Minnesota. Uh, John is now a distinguished McKnight University professor. Uh, Kurmeyer Chair in the Departments of Mechanical and Biomedical Engineering and the Medtronic Backen Endowed Chair and Director of the Institute of, for Engineering and Medicine at the University of Minnesota. So he's wearing a lot of hats and most recently uh, he's become the Director of the Na National Science Foundation Engineering Research Center Advanced Technologies for Preservation of Biological Systems, ATP Bio for short, which has launched early in September. So that's a very exciting endeavor, and I'm proud to be part of that too. So John has received many awards during his career, including the ASME uh, Van Mao Medal, and fellowships in societies, including cryobiology, JSPS, ASME, and AIMBE. Uh, he served as the president of the Society for Cryobiology and the chair of the bioengineering di division of the uh, American Society for Me Mechanical Engineers. So John's work is uh, in the area of thermal bioengineering with a focus on biopreservation and thermal therapy and nanomedicine. And today in his talk, he'll focus on the use of gold and iron oxide nanoparticles for heating of biomaterials and tissues of multiple scales uh, for applications in regenerative medicine. Uh, we're very excited to hear his work and welcome. Thank you so much, uh, Basak and uh, yeah. our colleagues in, in, uh, in Turkey and Istanbul. It's a, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here with you. Uh, let me just share my screen. Is that showing up okay, Basak? Yes, yes, it does. Okay, great. So uh, Basak did a nice job already uh, explaining, but uh, yes, I am. I'm wearing lots of hats these days. But uh, what I'd like to do in my talk is is tell you a little bit about this big new center, which is, is very exciting. It's between MGH and uh, Minnesota, as well as Cal Berkeley. And what we're trying to do with this is to actually achieve numerous societal benefits. So uh, we wanna actually uh, uh, preserve cells for cell therapies. So, you know, these are the drugs of tomorrow and we need to bank them to increase patient access. We also wanna get the right organ or tissue to the right person at the right time to, so for organ preservation and tissue preservation so that you have the best match possible. If we could have tissues off the shelf, we could actually do drug testing and shrink the cost of you know, more than 2 billion per drug with uh, greater cell and tissue availability. We could also bank transgenic lines uh, and, and model systems for, uh, for instance, zebrafish and Drosophila, Xenopus and, and other vertebrate models. Uh, this will help us in, in genetic uh, and disease modeling. We can also bank coral reefs and aspire to a fauna bank like we have Svalbard for seeds, but there's no such thing right now for uh, fauna. We're working with the Smithsonian, Mary Hagedorn in particular, to try to bank corals right now, which is, as everyone knows, uh, 
being dramatically impacted by climate change. If we could take the embryos of some of these aquatic systems and we could bank them, that would also impact aquaculture. So we could take fish or some of these other aquatic species that may be seasonal breeders, and we can actually uh, take them out of uh, their cryo storage and basically grow them at any time of the year. So close to where I live, there's a green recirculating uh, facility where they do aquaculture and aquaponics with salmon. And if they had this uh, technology, they say that they would be able to actually create, you know, one sixth of all of the salmon eaten in one green recirculating facility in the United States. So one sixth of all salmon eaten in one facility. Uh, we would also be able to bank and, and uh, create dressings for mass casualty events, such as the one that you saw in New Zealand with the volcano and improve trauma and battlefield injury, uh, and maybe even impact space travel if we can understand torpor, which is something, uh, it's really like hibernation, but it's something that can be done at, a, at a, a higher temperature, even at room temperature, if done properly. So you see many, many potential societal benefits if we can improve uh, tissue preservation and, and uh, biological preservation. So the, the impact of this really uh, will be in supply chain management. So as Mehmet Toner likes to say, uh, we want to be the Amazon of living things. And if you look where, where we've really focused, it's in the green boxes where we isolate cells and tissues from a variety of different organisms. And maybe we culture and tissue engineer them and, and maybe we even grow them up in GMP facilities. But to get to the right-hand side in those blue boxes, which is the societal impacts that we just talked about, there are all these uh, red orange boxes that are associated with supply chain management and that's transportation and shipment and storage and creating repositories. And that's where preservation technology can have a dramatic impact. And this was one of the really compelling reasons why now for this big center over, uh, you know, across multiple institutions, which is MGH, Minnesota, UC Riverside, and UC Berkeley. So the concept is that we are really doing convergent science, and this has been a, a conversation, the, the concept around team science and convergent science and engineering has been around now for a little while. And, uh, you know, if you talk to Mehmet, he'll tell you it, it all started, you know, in Boston. I'm, I'm not sure that's true, but <laughs> I'll just say that. Uh, and the National Academies have written a book on this now. Um, actually, there are multiple books out on this concept uh, that new ideas really need to be facilitated across labs, maybe even across institutions to have real impact. And so this concept was one that we uh, aligned with early in our thinking. And this has been a process of more than two years to build this center. And what you see are really more of the engineering uh, uh, topics on the left, and more of the um, biological um, as well as medical topics on the right, we brought them together to address these overarching uh, uh, challenges, basically, that are unique uh, challenges, but they cross over all of these different scales and all of these different biological systems. So we want to avoid excessive ice formation when we preserve. We want to avoid toxicity due to the chemicals that we add that are like antifreeze that you might use in your in your car, but they're biological antifreeze. And we also want to avoid thermal and mechanical stress, like when you drop a, an ice cube in your drink and it always cracks because it's coming up convectively on the sides very rapidly, but not in the centers. So that that lag in the temperature, that, that uh, delta T across your system creates cracks. And so we want to mitigate that. So this is just to give you um, sort of a bird's eye view. You know, this is, you know, four institutions, really five, actually seven, if you count Carnegie Mellon, uh, Carleton and Toronto. Uh, we have, you know, 32 faculty. And most of them have some um, background in cryobiology, but we also have, if you look in the upper right, people working in engineering workforce development. So we're reaching back all the way into middle school where um, at least in the United States, you know, uh, girls and boys are equally interested in STEM education uh, at that juncture. And then right after middle school, it starts to diverge and, and boys are more interested than girls. So 
as an example, why is that and what can we do to make that maybe that gap be less uh, or maybe have no gap at all. And so one of the ways that we're doing that is through education with Jillian Rorick, where we would train teachers to go back with information about things like ATP bio that are going to be of interest equally to uh, men and women, girls and boys to keep their interest and pull them, you know, pull a more diverse workforce into uh, uh, society. And so then we also have other things like uh, ethics and public policy, where we're uh, working with National Academy member Susan Wolf, who's actually trying to do anticipatory governance on some of the uh, technologies that I'll tell you about. So she's trying to get out ahead of these technologies and think what will it take for society to embrace these technologies, not just the FDA regulation, but also, for instance, uh, GMOs, people don't necessarily feel comfortable with GMOs. Well, part of that is because it was never properly socialized and, and people don't really understand uh, GMOs. Maybe with our technologies, we can do a better job and we can actually articulate that better and, and actually create a path for uh, societal impact and uh, for society to embrace these technologies. So these are just some examples. Um, what it really means is that you have things, not just research is going on, but also uh, engineering workforce development, creation of a, a diverse and, and uh, inclusive um, culture within the center and society. There's also an innovation ecosystem for translation of these technologies. So this is a very, very big idea. And uh, if you're, I'm sure Mehmet or Basak or others can tell you more about it, it's, it's been a very exciting journey. And uh, it's, it's just, we're, we're starting a five-year process that can be renewed for another five years. So what I want to talk now about is, is really, uh, you know, more on the, the science side, especially what, what my group does and a lot of at the folks at the University of Minnesota. We're really trying to um, use some of the biopreservation strategies from nature and you know, figure out how to apply them to all of these different systems. So if you look at temperature on the y-axis and concentration of this cryoprotective agents that we might be using, and these are really, like I said, biological antifreezes. So these could be sugars, they could be uh, certain types of alcohols or polymers. And so, you, you know, of course, everyone knows that it, as you go cold, you can hibernate, you can go into torpor. But once you actually, uh, whoops, here, hang on a second, I'm having a little difficulty here. There we go. If you have the uh, liquidus curve there in red, below that ice can be in your system. And so uh, these are all uh, biological systems that can survive with ice. And so two very well-known ones uh, are the Antarctic cod, where ice is basically within the bloodstream. And uh, they have created a protein uh, which actually acts like an antibody to the ice and will actually attach to the energetically favorable axis of the ice growth and stop it. And so that means that the ice can only grow in an energetically unfavorable way. And that gives this cod a couple of degrees Celsius of, of wiggle room, if you will. So it can, it can basically swim around in you know, uh, waters that have nucleated ice in it. It can have nucleated ice in its bloodstream, but the ice won't grow. And so that's a dramatic example. Uh, you also have Rana sylvatica, which is a frog that can survive with up to 65% of its body in, in the frozen state, which I'll tell you more about. And a lot of what my group has been working on is preservation in the glassy phase. So that's that blue curve. And there are a bunch of different examples of that, the tardigrade or water bear, Artemia cysts and Ar Antarctic nematodes that once they're in this glassy state, they're essentially uh, stable indefinitely. And so this is something that we've been very interested in. So one of the, uh, I guess, challenges in my group is you know, how do you get larger systems down to these states, especially the glassy phase, and then bring them back? And so that's a lot of the story that I'm going to tell you about today. So this is one example of partial freezing from uh, Ken Story, who's part of the grant, and this will give you some example of what we're trying to learn from, from nature. Their, their limbs can't be moved. They would be broken off. So this is a frog that survives yeah, under the alive. ice. 
So 65 But the most amazing thing is the fact that the wood frog comes back to life. Over a couple of hours, it makes a miraculous and complete. So this is after being 65% of its water being in the frozen state. They can literally be in the freezer for months and you take them out and then they thaw and they, uh, they can hop away. And they're flatlined. If you try to measure uh, activity in the brain, their heart, anywhere, there is no uh, measurable activity. So this is a great example of something that we might be able to learn from. And in fact, uh, at MGH, they have several uh, projects underway to essentially turn vertebrate systems like a zebrafish into a frog with using different technologies that I'll tell you a little bit about. So, so this is actually uh, a uh, concept slide that Basak's husband originally, Corkett, put together and we've been borrowing it and using it. It's, it's a very nice overview of the different technologies in the center. So on the left, you can see the, again, the temperature on the y-axis and the storage duration on the x-axis. So perfusion and hypothermia, hypothermia being, you know, putting things on ice, those have been around for some time. And you see that box in the upper right, that's really how organs are kind of shipped today. They're shipped on ice. Uh, the technologies that you may have already heard of from MGH, they've been really pioneering this concept of supercooling in liver. And uh, Corkut, Basak, Mehmet, and others have been uh, publishing in some very high quality journals, some great work on both rodent as well as human livers that take you out to days in terms of your ability to store. And they're also working on partial freezing like that frog, and that would take you out to maybe weeks and months. And what my group is doing is we're actually trying to be also in the glass. And there's also a group at Berkeley working on isochoric, which is using pressure manipulation so that the ice crystal, which of course has a different density than the water can never actually form. So if you're in a high enough pressure situation, you, you can't actually change volume. Uh, so you, you basically um, <clears throat> stay in a liquid state, even though you've dropped the temperature way below uh, the liquidus. So this is what I'm going to talk to you about, give you some examples of applications in this area, and also mention that, you know, as an engineer, the really uh, exciting part of this is that these are we are, we are able to realize these biopreservation technologies through the manipulation of temperature, pressure, and concentration. And so that's, that's really exciting. And I think this is a huge opening field in this area. So this is what it looks like to be in a glassy phase. And you can see on the right, this is a vitrified or glassy kidney, and then one that's frozen on the left. So this is an iconic image from Greg Fahey. This was actually something that was around even when I was a PhD. Uh, and so what's interesting about that is that the, the uh, technology to actually get these larger systems, even as big as an organ, into the glassy phase has been around for a while. And so people use antifreeze, basically biological antifreezes to get to this glassy phase, but the problem is coming back. And so to come back, you need to come back fast, fast enough so that you don't freeze or de-vitrify, you know, go from a glass to a crystalline phase on the way back up. And you need to do this in a way where it doesn't crack. So everyone knows glass is brittle, just like uh, that ice cube, if you drop it into that water, if you have too much of a gradient in the system, it'll crack. So these are the, the two big concepts that we try to deal with in, in my group when we're dealing with these vitrified systems. So in all cases, what we really need is rapid and uniform rewarming to address this. And so you, you can see this on all scales, whether it's from droplets to tissues to organs. So you're going from something that might be a millimeter or less to centimeters in the case of organs. And uh, how, do we, how do we get uniform and rapid rewarming? So again, you can see your failure modes in the middle, devitrification or cracking. And one important thing here on the bottom left is that there's a critical cooling rate that critical cooling rate is what Greg was able to already do back in the 80s, which is to basically you get enough of this cryoprotective agent in, you can then you have to cool it sufficiently rapidly that you can actually reach the vitrified state. 
But then if you look on the y-axis here, the critical warming rates, they're always one to two orders of magnitude higher than the critical cooling rate. And that's why he was really never able to bring back those organs. And it's still uh, a rate limiting step today is because coming back in those large systems you know, at 100 or 1,000 C per minute is, is essentially not, not possible. And so if you come back too slowly, you're going to devitrify. And if you come back too fast on the, on the edges, you're going to crack. And this is just lo looking at that from the point of view, again, of a phase diagram on the left. And it kind of explains one of the problems, both on the way down and the way back up, is as you drop below the liquidus and you're trying to get to the glassy phase, especially when you're at low concentrations, you have this huge window of temperature that you have to traverse to get there. And so you're going to have to do that twice, once on the way down and once on the way back up. So that's a huge barrier. Uh, and you can see again that the critical warming rates, and this is log scale on Y, and you can see we're getting into some really, really fast rates here that I'll talk a little bit more about. But if you're down here in two molar, which will work for some of the smaller systems, you're going to be in the hundreds of thousands of C per minute on the way down, but then you need to be in the tens of millions on the way back up. So these are just giving you some sense of you know, scale and rate. We can also think about this um, in terms of the, the size of these systems and the, the concentration of CPA we might be uh, using or need to use. And the heat transfer, basically, in an organ, we're never going to be traveling at millions of C per minute in a large centimeter scale system. So we have to use a larger concentration in those systems. As we drop in scale to a tissue that might be on the millimeter scale or several millimeter scale, we can go into slightly lower concentration. And then finally in droplets, we may actually get into these, uh, you know, I would say, you know, much smaller, you know, just a few molar concentrations. And again, the warming rates have to be, you know, orders of magnitude higher than the critical cooling rates. One interesting thing that really caught our attention and has really been capturing the field of cryobiology now for the last 10 years is that if you are able to reach these really, really fast rates, and Peter Mazur was one of the first, I think he was the first to do it, he was actually using pulsed near infrared lasers that would be absorbed by India Inc. So India Inc. is just a broadband absorber. And what he showed in mouse oocytes and other systems is that you know, there's a forgiveness on the way down in terms of the cooling rate if you can come back with a really, really fast warming rate. And so these are just giving us more and more clues as to, you know, what's forgivable and what's not, where are the exact failure modes and what are the critical rate limiting issues for uh, bringing vitrified systems back. And so the rate is really, really important. So this is just a, a slide to kind of put it a little bit into context. If we're in this really high concentration regime, that would be something like you might need for an organ. The critical cooling rates are going to be in the, you know, well, one to 10 C per minute, roughly. And then you're going to need to come back in the 100 C, maybe even a little bit higher rate. For low concentration, and this might be something like a cell type that's a, a very precious or rare or sensitive cell type, you're not going to be able to load it with a molar. And so you're going to go to a lower concentration, but then the price you pay is that you need to go at these faster rates. So 10 to 100 uh, thousand C per minute on the way down and maybe all the way up to tens of millions on the way back up. So this is just something to keep in mind. So this is a little vignette of uh, telling what Greg Fahey did. So when he was unable to bring that organ back in, you know, this was 1984 when he published that paper, the next year he published this in Nature. And what he had done is he basically applied the same technology, the same ideas to vitrifying mouse embryos. Well, mouse embryos, of course, are 100 microns in size, rather than, you know, these organs, which are centimeters in size. And sure enough, it worked. And the reason why it worked is that he was able to come back in a fast and uniform way sufficiently for this system. And you know, this was a huge deal. This was the beginning of assisted reproductive technologies. There's probably not a person alive who hasn't heard of the, our ability for humans as well as for a variety of other 
uh, mammalian systems, we can bank embryos. So this is just to say this, it, it does work, right? So in our lab, what we've done is we've taken some of the concepts from Peter and we've been trying to scale it and create platform, a platform technology. So where Peter was able to work on a mouse oocyte or a mouse embryo that might be, you know, in the, you know, 100 micron size range, we were trying to work on something like a zebrafish embryo that is an aquatic species. Nobody's been able to work on that. It's a very important uh, genetic and, you know, biomedical model system. Pretty much everybody's heard of it. And the issue is that they're about a thousand times larger in volume than a mouse oocyte. So they're almost a millimeter across, and there's no way to just heat it from the outside alone to, to have these, uh, you know, a successful um, preservation. And so Peter Mazur tried this with India Inc. and it just did not work. He tried it several, many times. And so what we did was, you know, if you try to put India Inc. into one of these embryos, it's basically toxic. So that's a no-go. So we shifted to using plasmonic gold nanoparticles. And we've been, you know, looking at this for other reasons. And a lot of other people, there's a huge field associated with this that most people know about in terms of nanomedicine and the use of lasers and, and, and uh, plasmonics. And we actually uh, adopted that for this purpose. And we micro injected the gold nanoparticles directly into the embryo. We demonstrated that there was a sufficiently uniform distribution of the gold. And then uh, we basically would uh, vitrify first on the left. And then with a uh, automated system, we would bring, bring this under a pulse laser. This is a millisecond pulse laser. And we could, we could uh, bring back zebrafish. And of course, this can be used now on a variety of different systems. So we might be able to scale this from a zebrafish up to a salmon egg, like I mentioned. We may also go the other direction where we just use extracellular heating, like Peter's already shown with mouse oocytes, but we would use it on other systems. So that might be pancreatic islets, or it might be shrimp larva or coral larva for that matter, which we've also published on. So for the, the zebrafish, uh, this is particularly exciting because as I mentioned, no one has actually been able to um, cryopreserve this system and many people have tried. So we finally were able to do it in 2017. We brought back embryos that were actually intact and growing, although none of them hatched. And then last year, actually, I'm sorry, this year, we just published on uh, the follow-on study to that showing that we could get them to actually hatch. Uh, it's still low percentages, but this is a, a mon, you know, it's a, uh, a first, if you will, in terms of this type of technology. And so this is just really laying out the method and I won't go into gory detail here, but the micro injection piece is, is very, very important uh, in terms of getting those gold nanoparticles into the embryo and, and spread around sufficiently. We then need to rapidly cool uh, the embryos. If, if we fail, you can actually see the failures because you have crystallization. Well, you know, and we can also see it uh, transparent and glassy if we're successful. So that allows us then to store. When we want to bring out the, the embryo, uh, we then laser warm and we get this fast and uniform 10,000 C per minute or greater uh, warming. And then we uh, actually have a post-warming bath. There's this pre-freezing bath and this post-warming bath were actually critical uh, innovations in our method. And then we were able to uh, see this, this growth and hatching over, over time and actual growth to adulthood and mating and spawning as normal. And so that's what this data is showing. Uh, we actually had several of these fish, uh, several of them are still alive. And you know the, the percentages are quite low, but there was nothing, none of these bars existed in the past for any zebrafish prior to this work. So there was nothing at one hour, either, you know, and certainly nothing at, at day five or going to adulthood. So these, these adults then were able to spawn very similar to control. And uh, that's what we just published in advanced biosystems. So this is an exciting direction. Lots to optimize in, in many of the, uh, the protocol steps still. And we're working on things like automated injection and 
different aspects where we can find rate limiting steps that we can address to uh, characterize and make it a more robust method. So where, where are we going with this? Uh, we, we've been um, pushing this out into precious, you know, or rare or primary cell lines, you know, such as hepatocytes and uh, uh, stem cells and, and uh, cells of this nature that are going to be important in cell therapies. We've worked on coral with Mary Hagenorn. We're working in aquaculture systems like Pacific white shrimp with uh, cryoocyte, which is an aquaculture company. And of course, our continued work in zebrafish. Uh, lots of other systems were uh, uh, interested in applying this to. And as I say, it's a, a very interesting platform technology. So I'm going to switch and talk a bit about um, a different type of nanoparticle. So where gold nanoparticles, uh, they, their absorption is uh, extremely high. So they're like three orders of magnitude higher uh, or more capable, I should say, of, of uh, absorbing laser light and then converting that to heat. But the problem with laser is that it attenuates within the system. And so while you can get this intense absorption and then heating of the gold, you can't really spread that through a centimeter scale system or even a you know many millimeter scale system. It's very hard to do that. And so this is a separate technique that allows us to begin to think about doing that. And it really uh, works because the radio frequency fields that excite these nanoparticles and, and metal forms are able to, to traverse through the biological system relatively unattenuated. It's not that there's absolutely no interaction, but it's a very small interaction that we can compensate for. And so we're working with both super paramagnetic and ferromagnetic uh, nanoparticles, as well as metal forms, which have eddy current heating. And so you have a variety of different magnetic relaxation processes that have been well described in the literature. And we are basically using that then in applications to rewarm larger vitrified systems. And so here's one example where we're working on something uh, like the aorta. Aortas are, uh, to my knowledge, had not been cryopreserved prior to this work. And they are two millimeters thick. <clears throat> That's a very thick tissue. Arteries that are one millimeter thick or less had been preserved since the early 2000s, maybe even the late 90s, by a variety of different groups around uh, uh, the globe but nobody had really done these really thick systems. And so in order to address this, we used basically it's glorified aluminum foil that we wrap on the inside and the outside of these thicker arteries. And after they've been appropriately loaded with cryoprotective agent, we can then rewarm them at thousands of C per minute. This is much better than we can achieve with convection, which is just you know in the hundreds of C per minute. And it allows us then to do these thicker tissues, but it also allows us to potentially, well, to actually load less cryoprotective agent in the thinner tissues because you have this more rapid rate. So it gives you both of these uh, advantages. So this is just some of the, the data here. First, femoral and carotid, these are thinner uh, arteries, you know, one millimeter or less. And we have been able to, and other people have been able to cryopreserve those. Um, but aorta, you can see very, uh, very low viability because it's so thick. And that's traditional methods. So what we did is we studied this um, and what we're looking at here, heating rate on the Y axis, thickness of the tissue on the X. And these are different cryoprotective agents. So we have DP6 or like six molar, VS55 8.4, and then uh, M22 is 9. Point, uh, I think it's two molar. So you're going up in concentration and loading. And then you're increasing also here uh, in, in these more vertical lines, this is going up in heating rate using different technologies with uh, the metal forms as well as nano warming with metal, uh, with ma magnetic nanoparticles. And you can see over on the right, we are able to actually get uh, to a, a, a high viability case if you load the CPA sufficiently uh, and you, you study the process on the heating. 
And so this is just showing we can get to 2000 C per minute with our, our highest heating forms and, and fields. And that that allowed us then for the first time to with M22, which is this case here in purple, we were able to get a high viability for the first time after looking at appropriate loading protocols on the X axis. So this was just published in advanced healthcare materials and some of the older work uh, in the annals of biomedical engineering. So now I'm gonna kind of shift gears one more time and talk about the magnetic nanoparticles only and how we started working on arteries, but then we began to um, mod modify that and look at how to distribute that throughout organs. So we published in 2017 in Science Translational Medicine, the concept that you had a scalable technology which could be used on small or large arteries, uh, you know, up, up to 80 milliliters. And we're, we're now building something much larger than that. And um, the concept simply is that you, you take this system, you know, you load it with your cryoprotective agent and your nanoparticles inside the lumen and around. You can store it when you need it. You just bring it back and radio frequency rewarm it. And then you can transplant. This is just showing some of the uh, characterization we did, the cooling here, uh, allowing us to get cooling rates that are above the critical cooling rate. Plus we added in an annealing step to relieve some of the stress so we don't crack. And then the warming rates you can see below that also above the uh, critical warming rates needed. You can see our failure modes in the bottom as well as success. So vitrification success on the left and then failure modes by either cracking or crystallization or both on the right. And this on the top left is really micro CT advanced imaging to uh, tell us when we had actually loaded sufficiently in the artery, the different cryoprotectants. So this is VS55, it's a cocktail that we use. And this is showing in steps of 18 minutes, you know, up to 180 minutes. Uh, how well we've actually permeated the cryoprotectant into the artery. Um, so now we've been using that. Um, we've gone past where we were with the, uh, the original work there in 2017. And we've demonstrated against cold storage. We have um, uh, this video, unfortunately, isn't working. But we've been able to do multiple uh, nano-warmed artery transplantations, and they're uh, good for many months. Um, you can see here for cold storage that after a month you're you're losing the viability in in the uh, cold stored arteries, whereas ours are remaining high in in nano warmed uh, and right up there with with fresh. We haven't published this yet, but this is uh, what's coming. And so now the the question is: All right, you've you've worked on these artery systems and and tissue systems. Can you apply it to whole organs? And of course, this is the you know, we've, we've gotten several big grants to try to work on this. There, there are uh, just a, a number of real engineering challenges to doing this, as you might imagine, and, and I'll try to explain them to you. But the, the concept is really that we're going to try and put the cryoprotective agent in, and we're going to try to put the, the nanoparticles in, vitrify, <clears throat> and then put it into the radio frequency coil to rewarm in a fast and uniform way when we need the organ and then wash out the iron oxide nanoparticles and the cryoprotective agents and then you know use the kidney. So this is this is the concept and I'll show you sort of where we are with uh, you know our, our data. We're getting ready to publish our first paper on this and so the perfusion system itself is uh, again something that you know Greg Fahey actually did something like this already in the 1980s so I'm not going to tell you that this is a completely new technology, but figuring out how to do what he's done uh, and then do it reproducibly, it remains a challenge, especially when you're trying to put in nanoparticles. So there, there are very interesting questions associated with how do these nanoparticles aggregate or not aggregate, uh, their surface functionalization, what happens in terms of colloidal stability of these nanoparticles when they're static or in flow. Uh, what temperature do you need to add the cryoprotective agent into either the liver or the kidney uh, or any other organ to avoid toxicity? How do you get it in and get it out? All of these things are 
uh, you know, areas of ongoing um, you know, study. And so this is just some data showing you that we have, you know, uh, we can read out the pressure, we can read out in a refractometer uh, how much, uh, in this case, ethylene glycol, but it could be any CPA is getting in and, and getting out of the organ as you wash in and wash out. Uh, we can then study the vitrification process. This is actually Yoed Rabin's uh, group that studied this. And you can see, you know, to start with, we can assume that we understand the properties of the, the kidney and the CPA. Uh, and we can certainly model it. And he's done a really, he's one of the world's experts in this. And I think in the future, what we're going to do is we're going to superimpose information associated with the actual vasculature of the organ where the, the iron is. And so this is you know, work that's in, in progress. And that's a collaboration with both Greg Fahey and Yoed. And this is just a micro CT using a contrast agent demonstrating the concept that you know, you're gonna have iron oxide in the vasculature, therefore you're gonna have heating in the vasculature but not necessarily in the parenchyma. So this is the data that we have right now for um, kidneys. And what you see here on the edge and the center we, we placed in an ADML system um, a fluoroptic probe. So you, it's hard to measure in an RF field if you're using thermocouples. So we use fluoroptics. And what we were able to show is that we can cool down in a reproducible way that's greater than that critical cooling rate necessary. Um, very little thermal, uh, as you go looking down at B, very little uh, difference between the center and, and the edge. So we can get to the vitrified state just like Greg did back in the 80s. And uh, then we looked at, you know, if you convectively warm, uh, you, you come up fast on the side, but you lag in the center, just like the ice cube, and you get these huge temperature gradients. And in fact, in many cases, we crack. If we nano warm, you can see that both the edge and the center are coming up uniformly and there is no thermal gradient. So this is sort of the, the demonstration that you know, this is working from a heat transfer point of view. And so where are we now with physical assessment and, and functional assessment? Well, we've been working in the heart, the liver, and the kidney. And what you're seeing here is, you know, the uh, fresh controls on the left. The middle is with iron oxide loading and cryoprotective loading. And then you've got washout of both nanoparticles and cryoprotective agents. So there's a lot of as I said, nuance associated with the perfusion, the heart ends up being, <clears throat> well, each organ has its own challenges with regard to the perfusion. Um, and we've been able to demonstrate with all of them that we can cool them down to the vitrified state. We can demonstrate vitrification versus failure, which you see in these photographs on the right. We can study where the iron is within the system using advanced imaging. We can measure the nano warming in the system uh, demonstrating that we don't have thermal gradients and that we're coming up sufficiently rapidly. And we can measure how much the, the iron is coming out of the system using ICP mass spec and things of that nature. And um, I'm going to just say, you know, most is coming out, but not all. And this is, of course, you know, an area for uh, more study. We also have some uh, functional assessments that we've been doing, you know, with, with TTC staining, beating, uh, activation maps on the, on the heart. Uh, in the liver, we're able to demonstrate after nano warming that we have high cell viability, although we have some ICG in the bile, which is not ideal. That suggests that there may be some vascular injury that we have to work on, but the fact that all these cells are viable is great. And it means that there may be some intermediate milestones that we can take advantage of before we have a transplantable organ. So for example, think of all of the human organs that are not used for transplantation. What if we could use some of those organs to actually bank the cells and then we could process the cells when we're ready in some kind of central facility and use those human hepatocytes for organoids, for drug testing or other things that uh, could still have that societal impact. Uh, in the kidney, we can use both MRI as well as micro CT to study where the iron is. And we can do this, of course, in all of the organs. And what really is interesting here on the, uh, we published this in advanced science uh, just this year, the formulation of the iron 
is really important. If you have a poor formulation, you can see these sort of beaded structures on the left versus a more continuous, uh, uh, you can see the vascular outlines and more continuous shading on the right. This is associated with pressure changes as the nanoparticles go in and come out of the organ. And you can see with this EMG 308, which is the left, the pressure is really high. This is above 200, almost 300 millimeters of mercury, which is way above uh, physiological. Whereas for the uh, newer formulation, it, it comes back down to 100 or, or so, which is more reasonable. And this we think is because of aggregation, as I mentioned. So colloidal stability, aggregation, and formulation of nanoparticles is absolutely critical. So, you know, the future uh, for nano warming, you know, there, there's a variety of different uh, areas here. Many of them are actually physical as well as biological. So the formulation and the surface coating and the colloidal stability and the aggregation and, and the ability to uh, control that, to engineer that is, is absolutely critical. And so we are continuing to work on that. We published in advanced science, actually, I'm sorry, it was last year. And then coming up with new nanoparticles that heat more efficiency, that means, for instance, if we had a nanoparticle that was 10 times more efficient in heating in an RF uh, field, we would have to use 10 times less. And that would be, you know, less aggregation, potentially less, uh, you know, less left in the organ, and, uh, you know, would give us many, many benefits. Uh, and then clinical scaling, how do we get to an RF coil that could actually work on a human organ? And so we actually have that RF system uh, in place at the University of Minnesota, and we are hooking it up. Hopefully we'll be doing our first, um, you know, either pig or a human size organ in the, in the spring of 2021. So I wanna thank uh, all of the students that worked on these different uh, projects. And so in the radio frequency nano warming, which we published, actually the first concept for that was back in 2014 with Michael Etheridge. And then Navid uh, and Z published in Science Translational Medicine. And uh, Z just uh, published in Advanced Science. Ani is uh, also a postdoc who came and is working in this area. And he's been working both on uh, metal seed warming as well as radio frequency nano warming with Zhang Hu. For the metal seed warming. And then the laser nano warming. This was Kanaf Kosla who did the zebrafish work. Uh, he's been assisted by Lee Zan over there on the right and Joe Congas. Uh, and Lee is actually just finishing up his PhD now. He's been able to take some of these concepts and he's come up with uh, even a, a completely new way of doing warming. And he's been applying this to Dris Drosophila. So we will have uh, another paper coming out on Drosophila soon, which will be really exciting because there again is a system there, there, that there are no robust protocols for Drosophila. And there's a great need for that worldwide for maintenance of uh, Drosophila stocks, another important biomedical uh, model system. So lots of people to acknowledge the students, my collaborators, uh, both inside and outside of the University of Minnesota. Eric Finger is in the Department of Surgery. He's an MD, PhD, and our labs have essentially merged on this topic. So we meet, uh, you know, every week several times together with our students and technicians and uh, continue to work on nano warming. And funding from a variety of different uh, entities, NIH, DOD, and more recently, uh, since September 1st, this ERC, ATP Bio. Uh, I also want to credit many people for helping with the concepts, with the slides. Uh, many of the collaborators are from the Society of Cryobiology. We work both with the Organ Preservation Alliance and the small company called Silvatica, uh, also nanocomposites and cryoocyte uh, quite closely. And with that, I'll thank you and be happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you so much, John. That was really exciting. So uh, we have one question in the Q&A and I realized in the midway in your talk, I forgot to mention to our audience that they can type in their questions. Uh, so please go ahead and type in any questions you might have and we'll see it. Um, so there's one question, as I said, uh, John, uh, 
Would you like to read it or do you want me to read it to you? Um, uh, I, I guess I can read it. Um, yeah. uh, great work. I'm very curious whether there is a correlation with preconditioning of organs and tissues with different types of stress and efficiency of preservation. It might be also interesting to see signature genes if there's any benefit with stress. Uh, yes, this is, I think for sure, there's, there's, uh, there's a lot of, so, so I have to uh, give you my, um, you know, uh, my standard excuse. <laughs> I'm an engineer. So uh, I, I do some biology, but I'm more of an engineer than a biologist. So I can tell you, though, that there are, uh, you know, probably the most famous biologist I know working on this is Ken Story. So if you want to look up, he studies freeze tolerance. He studies desiccation tolerance. He studies uh, basically stress tolerance because these are all stresses. And he describes uh, at the molecular and genetic level what the organism is doing to actually survive those amazing stresses. So you're absolutely correct. Um, these things exist and they exist in nature. And now we're trying to learn from them. And I'm not, that's not really the focus of my program, but it is of some of the folks that we're uh, working with. Uh, Shannon Tessier at MGH is actually, uh, she studied under Ken's story. And I really, I, I really love some of the stuff that she's doing. You might want to look at what she's been publishing. And I believe she's just been funded to essentially turn a zebrafish into a frog and kind of, you know, recapitulate some of these preconditioning things that you're talking about. So I, I won't uh, steal her thunder, but that's Busak's colleague. And, uh, you know, both Ken Story and Shannon are expert in that area. Hopefully we'll hear from Shannon later this year during the seminar series. Cool. All right. A another question showed up. Um, it's actually in two parts. OK, uh, let's see. So two quick questions. Have you done any experiments using spheroids, including stem cells, and, and check the stemness properties of these samples when sample is unfrozen? So uh, we have not. It's a very interesting question. Question: We have started a, a project with Mayo Clinic where, where we're doing a comparison between um, tissue engineered pancreatic islets and uh, mouse isolated pancreatic islets. So that may begin to give us some ideas about this, but um, I, I, we, I'm not familiar with having looked at that, but I think it's a really important question. And the, uh, you know, I'll just say, you know, my lab uh, I've studied both sides of this, so we're a little schizophrenic, right? We, uh, we try to kill things some days. <laughs> we try to keep things alive other days. So there's another part of my program over the years that's been dedicated to cancer and cardio uh, cardiovascular disease where we're using focal therapies to, to destroy tissues. And this is a huge question uh, in the cancer field because a lot of people think that when you do cryosurgery or heat treatments or other focal treatments, yeah, you're, you're killing, you know, we, we, we love models as engineers, right? So we think there's one temperature and there's one approach, you know, and you kind of figure out what that is with cell lines and then you apply that to the tissue. And if you get that, everything's dead. Well, no, not so much, right? There's always recurrence. There's always uh, things that happen in tissues that you don't, you can't fully understand or, or, or uh, plan for. And one of them is this question that you're asking, which is, you know, uh, are all cells created equal? And the fact is they're not. Uh, stem cells, uh, you know, are different. And people in the cancer field, they believe that this is one of the reasons why with focal therapies, for instance, you have a tremendous amount of recurrence. Uh, that has not been all entirely proven to my knowledge, but there, there's a lot of discussion around that. So it's a very good question. And it's a long winded answer to say, I don't know. <laughs> uh, on number two, when you showed the data for the frozen zebrafish, why do you have higher standard deviations for 10 minutes in comparison to later time points? Could you please comment on conserving stability and repeatability of the freezing process? Now I have to go back and look at the graph myself here. Hang on. Uh, All 
All right, let's see. So 10 minutes. Is this the data set? We, do, we don't see the... Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, let's see. This data set? I can't read the Q&A, uh, um, Basak, so yes. please help me. So it's the data for the frozen zebra fish viability graph. Yeah, so this is the post-laser warming yeah. viability. And what we have is one hour, three hours, 24, 48, mm -hmm. and day five. And so earlier time oh, I, have a larger standard deviation. Oh, right. Well, <clears throat> I mean, the there's large variation here because, um, you know, what's going on in control is this is uh, this, this is natural attrition as the over time as as a natural embryo grows, we're putting these embryos under tremendous stress because we're, you know, micro injecting them, we're vitrifying them, and then we're laser warming them. And so these larger standard deviations are associated with basically that stress and the ability of the system to survive that stress. And I think it's also a, um, you know, an indication that our, you know, even though we think, you know, again, we're engineers, we think everything we do is sort of like, you know, extremely well planned and controlled. Well, there's a variety of reasons why every time you do this, it's a little different. So for instance, here, this 800 micron uh, uh, zebrafish, you have to poke this and then you have to inject. So the question is, where are you exactly injecting? So we, we have a one injection and a two injection approach. Um, and so that's right there, some variability. If you inject and pull back, how far into the embryo are you going? Um, are, you, are you injecting through the body of the embryo or are you coming from the other side? So there, you know, there's a variety of issues uh, like that. There's another issue associated with how you puncture the embryo and whether the embryo actually reseals properly or not, or whether you're actually leaking cryoprotective agent and gold out. So there, I could go on, but there, there are a variety of reasons why it's not a completely robust process yet, and we're we're working on it. But that's what those standard deviations are telling you is that it's not yet as robust as we would like. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, next question was for gold nanoparticle laser warming, how long are the pulse signals? Yeah, it's a millisecond. So if you, I mean, we can actually vary it, but it's, it's generally on the, uh, the order of a millisecond. And so the, the fastest rates, and you can kind of think about this, you know, this is a great simple scaling uh, type thing, you know, for, for engineers, right, is think about where the embryo is. It's, you know, basically minus 200 degrees, right? And you're trying to bring it back to room temperature. So 220 degrees or so. And you're going to do that in a millisecond. Well, that's millions, you know, tens of millions per minute-ish. Mm -hmm. And then if you spread it out over five milliseconds, of course, you, you drop the rate by a factor of five. And so those are the type of things that we can do with the, with the laser is we can very, very simply, you know, go through uh, ranges of rates. And it leads us to some other very interesting work that we're doing now, where we're trying to use that to do what we call laser calorimetry. And the laser calorimetry gives us the ability with high speed video, we can actually see whether we're being successful or not in the melt. And that's new information basic calorimetry approaches like differential scanning calorimetry is only good to about 100 C per minute. So using this kind of concept where we can play around with millisecond pulses and, and have success and failure and study that allows us to look at this range of, you know, two molar, three molar cryoprotective agents in a way that no one has ever looked at it before. All right, uh, there are a couple of more questions if you have time. Uh, sure. Yeah, so uh, this is another biology uh, question for you. I know you're an engineer, but another question regarding the cracking problem, what type of structures or proteins are mainly affected? Is it the membrane, extracellular matrix, or other types of structural proteins? 
That's a great question. So when I was a graduate student, there was a, a microscopy approach called freeze fracture. And so people would intentionally fracture their systems so that uh, what you would get is it would go along planes of lipids. So you would open up the membranes basically of cellular systems to study them at the level of the, the lipid membrane. So there's no doubt in my mind that the, the molecules play a role and that you know cellular membranes probably play a role at that level. But at this point, our understanding is really macroscopic. So we are, we are trying to study this from the point of view of you know, macroscopic delta T across millimeters or centimeters within our system. And you know, what would be the um, yield stress associated with a thermal stress that would crack it? And so this is a really interesting question that you raise. And I think ultimately somebody's going to need to drill down, uh, you know, to really understand what's going on at the molecular cellular level when these cracks occur. But right now, our understanding is really at the macroscopic scale. But, but I'm, I gave you the example of freeze fracture to encourage you, right? You're right. <laughs> it should matter. It really should matter. But we're just not there in terms of our understanding yet. Okay, last question is, uh, I would like to know whether the duration of how much time the organ states in vitrifi vitrified state affect the warming results or the, the outcome. Yeah, um, you know, we've studied that in a couple of systems. And so far, we've been limited to, you know, just studying months. We're not going out to years for probably, you know, obvious reasons. It just takes too much time. Um, it, it may be that there is such a thing, but, you know, this has been speculated on by, you know, the, the, the fathers of the field of cryobiology for some time. Once you're below the glass transition temperature, I mean, th these, these are the speculations that I'm just sharing with you, right? Because it, it's one of these things where, how are you going to do a high end study on a hundred year vitrified, you know, case? It's, it's just really hard to imagine that, right? So, the, but the speculation is that once you're below uh, the glass transition temperature with these systems, that you should be able to bank indefinitely. Now, that's not an entirely happy, you know, answer because people are like, well, you know, I don't know, I'm not going to accept that, right? But you have to ask the question, what are the things that would disturb the system once you're in that glassy state? And so then if you, if you flip the question like that, then you can start thinking about it. So one, one thing is that if you bump it or if you cycle the temperature, both of those things will diminish it, you know, the, the robustness of the preservation, right? It can actually destroy it. The bumping it could actually get it cracked or fractured. Uh, the cycling could lead to crystallization and nucleation. Um, <clears throat> the last thing that, uh, you know, was speculated by others is that depending on how you, and I haven't looked at this since I was a graduate student, frankly, but there's background radiation. So you may also have issues with background radiation affecting your sample over time. And so you may, you may actually be, you know, and, and that's not something I know a whole, a whole lot about, but it, it's something, basically, I, I would just flip, flip it and think about it, you know, what are the things that could change it? And then you could maybe study those things. So background radiation, cycling, bumping, mechanical, you know, it, I think it comes down to these sort of physical things that can happen to your sample because there's, there is no, that the being in the glassy state should in and of itself, there, you know, metabolism is essentially zero at that point. So you should be good for years basically is what I would say. Mm -hmm. Okay, one last question came. Uh, is there any experiment on cell cultures in 2P lit lithographically nano-featured micro lattices instead of the nano-gold particles? I don't know. Um, I, yeah, I, I mean, the, 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 there's a lot of work on cell cultures, uh -huh. and there's increasingly a lot of work on nanomaterials. So the question you had was very specific and I'm not familiar myself with exactly that that system but you know um, this is an increasingly interesting area of overlap you know nanomaterials and cryopreservation and nanomedicine as a whole so uh, it wouldn't surprise me 
if there was something out there. Mm -hmm. All right. I think that that covers everything that came from our audience. Uh, thank you so much, John. We, we really enjoyed it. And, uh, and yes, uh, I enjoyed it very much. Uh, thank you all. Uh, and I hope you have a nice afternoon and evening in Istanbul, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> thank thank you. you. All right. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thanks, Basak. Bye bye. Yeah, bye bye, okay.